Welcome back once again to the Dancing Sober Podcast. Really appreciate you coming back. Don't forget to like and subscribe if this is your first time here. It's really important that you subscribe to this channel. We are almost at 1,000 subscribers, and that's the current goal. Um, I want to give a big shout-out to our sponsors, of course, Movita Juice Bar. Thank you to Movita Juice Bar for sponsoring this podcast. Go to movitajuicebar.com to get some of their locations. You can go visit them, but you can also order Movita Juice Bar through their food apps. A big shout out to our sponsor, Picaresca Cafe. Picaresca Cafe is a little coffee shop in Boyle Heights over by the Sears building on Soto. Um, look them up on Instagram, Picaresca Cafe. And um, yeah, they have food pop-ups. They have all of the blended ice drinks that you want. And they also have your espressos and your Americanos. Um, please check them out, Picaresca Cafe. A big thank you to Espacio for letting us record in here. Espacio 1839 is a local art space or community space where you can um, come in here and be a part of your own radio show. Oh, yeah. Radio Espacio, they are an online radio uh, show. You can you can come in here and create your own show. They also put up local artists. Right now they have Ernie Lucero up in here. It's beautiful work. And, um, yeah, come check them out over at 1839 East 1st Street in Boyle Heights. This week we have as our guest artist, painter, printmaker, Sonia Romero. Let's get into it. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dancing Sober Podcast, and this week we have painter, printmaker, <laughs> multidisciplinary artist, La Señorita Sonia Romero. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. Good to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> Why are you so giddy? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you, and um. You know, I know that you're busy doing a lot of um, public artwork right now, but in this podcast, we like to start with, like, where you were from, where were you born, and all that stuff. Tell us some good stuff about, like, being young Sonia Romero. Okay. Um, I'm from Echo Park. I grew up in a Victorian uh, house in Angelino Heights, um, where my family had um, an art studio, and um, both sides of my family uh, are artists so I had an artistic household and I started showing my work and selling it when I was around seven years old wow yeah so tell the audience who your parents are okay my parents are Frank Romero and Nancy Romero and how was it growing up under like under that house under the Romero <laughs> <laughs> like the big name is was has it always been like a, well that's my dad um honestly or the opposite you shun um, away from it like, as a child, um, I think we actually spent more time with on my mom's side of the family. Mm. Um, my grandparents were Frank and Edith Wiley, mm. the founders of the Craft and Folk Art Museum. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, they had, like, this great ranch that we would always go to, and we would go to the museum, and, like, they traveled all over the world collecting folk art. Mm. And my parents collected folk art, too. We used to travel to, like, New Mexico all the time, and they had, like, blanket collections, and mm. my dad collects all sorts of weird stuff, like stoves, and <laughs> bowling balls, typewriters. So since you were little, you were, like, your eye was trained to look at stuff? Yeah, like, I've been looking at handcrafted art my whole life from not just, like, L.A., but from all over the world. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And and you said you started selling at seven? Yeah, because we had this, like, really cool event my whole life called the Christmas sale. It used to be called the Christmas sale. Now it's called the holiday sale. Okay. But uh, <laughs> okay. with the times. But, um, yeah, you started in our back studio and in our house mm. um, in Angelino Heights, and it was just, like, my dad invited and my mom invited um, artists to come show their work around the holiday season mm. to sell it. I would just, like, slip mine in. I would have a table there, too. Mm. It was successful. I was always successful. I always sold my work. So I would look forward to it every year. I would make a new series of art mm. every year for that sale. What, what kind of stuff were you putting up back then? Do you remember? Well, I remember I did, like, a fit goldfish in, in a gold, in a tank with, mm. like, a Christmas tree inside. That's nice. I was, like, around... 
1987. Were they like linoleum prints or drawings or? Well, actually, you used to do oil paintings as a kid. Really? Because that <laughs> that's was what, what was, was around. around. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty yeah. cool. Wow, somebody's got some cool collectibles somewhere. I know, but then I just kept doing it, like, age six, I mean, age seven, eight, nine, ten, mm. eleven, twelve. Like, I just kept doing it every year. Yeah. So yeah. there was never, like, a moment where you're like, I, I want to do art, or or did you one day, like, have that thought, like, okay, I'm going to be an artist, and I don't have yeah. to study anything else. I was always going to be an artist. Like, yeah. I always wanted to be an artist. Yeah, that's interesting. You never had... Like, let's say if Sonia Romero did not become an artist, what would she have been? No. <laughs> Nurse practitioner. No, I'm just one of those people that knows. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. From when but you know. now I'm just saying, like, yeah. let, ma imagine you, you weren't doing art. What would you be doing? What would you like to be doing? <laughs> you can always do art no matter what. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So you grew up around that. You went to high school at... Laxa. Yeah, I went to the LA County High School for the Arts, yeah. and visual arts. Yeah. Where a ton of people come out of, not only in painting but acting and musicians. Like yeah. a lot of people have come through yeah, there. Yeah, it's and a really good school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've even taught there um, in later years. Oh, okay, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. In theater arts. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> in printmaking. In printmaking, that's yeah. awesome. And um, it's still like a very well recognized school, right? Yeah, yeah. So. That was your uh, experience growing up. Um, any any good stories about like being a Echo Park kid? You know, did you ever join any gangs? <laughs> no, uh, my parents like sent me out of there for school. Like I didn't okay. go to school in Echo Park. Where'd you go? I went to Oakwood, which is a private school. Where is that though? In North Hollywood. North Hollywood. Yeah. Oh, okay. Did you bus or did Just they take you? Oh, they carpool. Yeah. yeah. And how was that school experience? Um, it was good. Is it an all-girls like, school? Or? No. It's like, it was a good school academically, but like socially, I was pretty miserable there. Mm. So when I like escaped to Lox, I was like in heaven because it was like a school of all the like rejects from like every county in Los Angeles, like coming together to make art. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Huh. What's your uh, favorite memory from Laxa, if you have one? Um, I just... I think every, I liked how free everybody was. I like everyone expressed themselves, like mm. with what they wore. Or, you know, it was so what, much more diverse. What did you used to dress like back then? Because <laughs> I could imagine all the little art kids. Yeah, it was so cool. Um, I used to dress totally 1940s. I was obsessed. <laughs> I would go to the flea market every weekend. Well, my dad likes to go to the flea market, so we always went there. But like I would just vintage or old timey? Vintage. No, everything vintage, like vintage mm. shoes. I had a huge collection. Mm. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. That was your thing. That was my thing for a while. I used to swing dance. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it was pretty popular in those years, right? I know it just happened to be popular, but I swear I thought of it myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and after Laxa, where did you um, take off to? Did uh, you go immediately to college? or? Yeah, I went to RISD, which is Rhode Island School of Design. Mm. Tell us about that. Um, well, well, why did you choose that school and why did you end up there? Um, everyone in my family, like on my mom's side of the family, goes to the East Coast for college. So I was mm. looking over there on the East Coast. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just applied there. I got in. Mm. Um, was there anything special about it? Mm, it's just supposed to be a good school. So I was like, all right. But what did you, what did you get from it? Um, well, I just learned more, like I had already three years of art school under my belt. So it wasn't like a shock to my system or anything. So three years of art school at Laxa. Yeah. La yeah. So like I came in there, I was like already a seasoned art student and another, mm. you know, took on another four years at RISD. My last mm. year I went to Italy for the whole year. So that was awesome. That was probably mm. my favorite year. Wow. Where, where was that? Um, what, what school was it though? It was RISD. RISD. Oh, they have RISD. Yeah. Oh, wow. They have a European honors program. Wow. For a select few. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you, were you like teacher's pet, top-notch kind of student over there? or? Um, I. How does that work? Um, I just want to get a little more sense of your experience in the East Coast, you know? I, well, pretty much I think the interesting story is I wanted to be a painter but then when I was time to choose um, majors, I decided not to go in the painting department because it was a really large department, like a 
bunch mm. of people went into it, and I, I didn't really want to be like one of the many. Mm. And they weren't really studying um, the t- kind of technique I wanted to learn. So I was like, okay, I'm either going to go into illustration, where you learn like all these amazing techniques, or printmaking, which is a small department where you can really stand out mm. um, and you get your own building and everything. So I went into printmaking, and sort of, mm. because I like being, you know, in a smaller pond. I think. And working, well, I mean, I guess everybody kind of paints alone, works alone, smaller pond. Um, what do you think, because um, there's a, a few famous artists that are also like RISD, and, and do you think there's like a specific thing that RISD develops in artists? No. No? Like, sometimes you could tell like all the people that come out of Otis do a specific oh. style, like all the people that come out of you know, art center have a specific yeah, style. Yeah, I know what, what you mean. What do you think RISD does? Um, I honestly like I just had such a strong background when I before I even got to RISD that yeah. I was like already my own person. I don't think I took on a style in particular there. Uh, yeah. From what I've noticed, RISD does a lot of perfection. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. It's like every yeah. artist has is very detailed and has like just perfect kind of. I don't, I don't even know how to put it. But I there's think like RISD a, has a really good, or it did have a really good uh, foundation, design foundation. Mm. So you really learn the basics. Mm. You learn, and I mean, you can't go wrong with that. Yeah. And and by the basics in design, you mean like composition, space? and. Yeah, they have a program that's 2D design, 3D design, and, and life drawing that you have to go through as a freshman mm. in order to like progress. So mm. they have, it's called foundation. Mm. So I think their foundation was you know, f- solid, which is why I wanted to go there as opposed to, like, more experimental art schools I thought were a waste of time. Was there ever any um, moment that you were like, fuck the East Coast, <laughs> I want to go home? Um, no, I mean, sorry, I um, I wasn't, like, I love the East Coast, so I was like, okay, I never was, like, not going to come home. I was always going to come back. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but, I mean, like, were you... Any I didn't di- like any New York. Any difficulties at school, anything like that? Like a... I don't know. Villain origin story or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, I was just wondering, like, you know, was there any struggles or was it just like, hey, I'm just showing up to work, I'm going to sleep, and then I'm going to be home in a few years? Yeah. Yeah. No stories. <laughs> was there a favorite teacher? Instructor? Um... No. Well, I mean, RISD had to. It didn't have a huge impact on me. That's yeah, that's what I'm trying. What I'm trying to say, like, it had to have some impact. I feel like Loxa had more of an impact on oh, me okay. than, than RISD did. Yeah. Uh, in the sense, like, it helped you um, understand art or understand what you were as an artist, or what, how do you think that happened, or what kind of impact did Loxa have on you? I, I feel like it's the diversity of the community. Like, it just had mm. a really great, diverse community. And RISD was kind of boring that way, in that way. So it was more like a job, like a nine-to-five. You show up in <laughs> class, you do your work, you go home. Yeah, I don't know. Oh. I didn't... Yeah. After RISD... <laughs> <laughs> dead, end, dead end topic. Yeah. So after RISD, um, you come back to L.A. And were you like, I'm back. <laughs> Did you start uh, painting in your own studio or? Yeah, I mean, I just started working. Was that a, a BFA? Yeah. yeah, BFA in printmaking. And so once you came home, um, yeah, you started working in. Yeah, just in my room in my house mm. um, with my mom. My mom and I lived by ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I, the first thing I did is I met Artemio Rodriguez at a mm. art opening. Mm-hmm. Um, and I asked him if I could intern with him. He was at Self Help Graphics at the time mm-hmm. in the downstairs at the old location. And so he said yes. So I interned with him for almost a year. Yeah. That's awesome. So that's where um, you learned a lot of your printmaking. So that's I mean, where you I already learned linoleum cut, linoleum. Printing, which is not something I learned at RISD. At RISD, I yeah. studied lithography and etching and silkscreen. Oh, okay. And so he was a master linoleum cut yeah, yeah. Uh, artist. And um, I picked that up from him in that year. So I did this project on my own where I did an alphabet from A to Z. Mm. So, you know, I did 26 linoleum cuts during that year, and then I made it into a book. 
Mm. And through that project, I was able to pick up linoleum cut and master it to some level. Mm. Nice. What year was that? Like 2003. 2003. And Two to three. so little by little, did you start showing? Um, when did you start showing or did you go back to painting? When did that happen? Um, yeah, I just started showing right away. Like, um, I already had like contacts in the art world. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the Christmas sale was still happening too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, at that time in my life, I did not consider myself to be um, a Chicana artist. Mm-hmm. And But then like something changed where like people started asking me to be in all of these shows with that identity as the theme. Mm. And I, for the first time in my life, had to confront that um, choice. Identity. Or identity, or do I want to take this on as identity? I don't feel like I have it as my identity, but then, like, that's the rest of my life till now, the end. (laughs) (laughs) That's not the end. (laughs) That's not the end. Well, I want to hear about that. Yeah, Yeah, I want to hear about, like, I mean, how did you come to terms with this? Or how, how do you feel about, like having that like thrust upon you in a way I mean um we just said a little bit about who your dad is Frank Romero but if anybody knows Frank Romero he's a really famous Chicano artist oh, and so really? oh. yeah <laughs> I mean, there's some people out there that might not know yeah but so being you know in that world and and having all this you know pretty much thrust upon you how yeah. like I mean how did how did you deal with that that's you know, that's something that, and I've known you for a lot of years. We haven't talked about it too much, but. Well, I mean, like, at first I went to my mom. I was like, Mom, they want me to be in this, like, Chicano identity show. And she mm. was like, what? That's ridiculous. Yeah. And I was like, oh. And what's what's your mom's ethnicity? My mom's ethnicity is, um, like, German, Russian, Jewish, but non-practicing. And your dad? My dad's ethnicity is, mm. like, his family comes from New Mexico, from um, Santa Fe. So... You felt, I mean, you were around Chicano artists growing up, right? Yes, I was. All the people that were part of the, all the people that were around the holiday sales. I was around, I've always been around the Chicano art community. Um, My, you know, that that has been my cultural identity. It's just like my parents didn't raise me in a way that made me feel like it was okay to take that identity on. Mm. I think it's just because they never thought about it. Mm-hmm. They didn't raise you um, like Orthodox Jew or nothing like that, right? Well, neither of them are religious. Okay. So no religion? And no. So, I mean, so I, so became identity like, was pretty much up in the air, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, it, I, I mean, it would have been easier if, you know, they'd been pounding it into me from, like, a kid, you know, like, yeah. this is your identity, like, take it on, you know, but... No, they just, neither of them thought about things that way. And how do you feel now? Um, well, I've had to, like, think about it so often. This was, this was way back. This is back 20 years ago, but it's something I have had to think about, like, every day since then. Um, you have to carry it? Yeah. Into every piece? And because, like, in my professional life, I'm only seen as that. Oh. And so, have there been any, like, um, backlash or confrontations because of that with you or what do you mean like has anybody said like why are you using this or well I mean I haven't really um used it but I've allowed people to um identify me as that all the time I allow people to include me and Mm. um and um then I had to think about what that means and I had to become part of the community, like become an active part of the community. Mm -hmm. Um, And to study, you know, Chicano art history and Chicano history and um, and to study identity politics and wonder what that means. And um, then I had to study what it means to be like a light-skinned Latinx person and Mm -hmm. what that means. And I just put so much thought into it and I'm so careful about it. Yeah, I mean... It's it, it it could be a tricky subject it's even a, even yeah. for me sometimes you know I I get into um different discussions with people that are you know more Mexican or you know or you're not Mexican enough and all that stuff and I mean I look Arab so <laughs> <laughs> so you know who knows where my blood comes from yeah but but I, yeah I mean that's really interesting um and I'm glad uh, that you were not afraid to bring it up and and um, talk about it I just wonder if there's like um 
do you think that you've had like uh, benefits because of it, or do you think that it's been the same struggle for you? Or, I mean, it's hard to say because uh, God, it's I didn't, I didn't, wa- sword. I didn't want to do this either. But like, you're because your dad's name and your name are the same. Like, has that helped you more than, or is it? I don't know. It's double edged because like it does open doors for yeah. me. Like, oh, like. I can place you in history, therefore I'm going to consider you, I'm going to look at your work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so people are, are, are more willing to look at my work um, because of who I am in, in um, relation to my father. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other hand, I still, as a 42-year-old woman, am being introduced as Frank Romero's daughter at mm-hmm. art openings <laughs> from one Chicano to the next, and yeah. that is embarrassing. Yeah. And because I have been working on my art career for decades, and I do a lot of work, and I accomplish a lot. Yeah. So. Yeah, I could see. I mean, the weight of it, it's like a foundation and also, like, sandbags. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of both. Though. Yes, exactly. You got yeah. it. Wow, that's really cool. I mean, really <laughs> interesting or, or just tough. Yeah, I could see that. Um. So let's get into um, some of the projects that you're working on. Oh, I know that you're like, your work is already in all these collections that you just mentioned. Like, so you're in collections that will live on in history. So like your work does have like historical. Yeah, my work is in various collections, um, you know, like LACMA or Smithsonian or. The Cheech. um, The Cheech. I have pieces in the Cheech. uh, Tell them I said what's up, please. (laughs) <laughs> Don't look at my work. No, okay. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go ahead. Uh, and the, what is it? The inaugural show. I have like four pieces in it. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And I know that um, you've also done a lot in like public art. Yes. And uh, we've worked a few times yes. um, closely together in uh, some projects you want to tell us about your favorite projects or like how did you start doing public art i started doing public art in 2007 um well uh my first project was just a poster for the metro system for the city of pomona and then from that i applied to a station and i won a station which is the macarthur park westlake um, metro station Mm -hmm. it's a tile mural that's one of the tile murals down there i think there's three murals down there Mm -hmm. in the mezzanine um, and then, uh, back then like Metro had like more like flexibility with what artists did. Right. Um, they're, it seems like now they're yeah. like, all right, here's a little square for you. Do what you're going to do within the square. But back then it really it, just depends on like what they're doing, like mm, what they're building. Yeah. With it, like mine was a retrofit. So the station was already built. Mm. So they were just adding art to like a section they felt like needed more art. Mm. Um, but if you get a station that hasn't been built yet, there might be a different kind of opportunity. Mm. But, um, anyway, so that was a great start in public art. And then like I started working with, um, the LA County Arts Commission back then, which is what it was called. And, um, the CRA, which no longer exists. And then I just kept getting job after job and then I just never stopped. And I've done over 10 permanent public art collections in LA County. So just to explain, um, maybe some artists that are listening that are young and, and have not gone through the process of, of getting a public art contract, let's first explain, like, public art is basically, you know, <clears throat> when somebody commissions you to do some work that's going to be displayed publicly, and they reach out to a pool of artists, and they select one, right? So there's an entire process that you have to go through. Yeah, so you basically you can submit your portfolio to open calls, and then they might put you in a pool, meaning like you're allowed, they'll be looking at your portfolio several times over the next like two years, um, or they'll just select you for to be a finalist in a project. Once you're a finalist in a project, um, you have to make a, a design, competitive design that you will present to a committee, a panel of judges, you know, with maybe like three to five other artists, depending on the project. Mm. And then if you win, then you move forward with your final design and the commission. So how do you find these projects? Um, I think just through like 
the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you have to Google... Um, you I can start with Metro Art. RFPs? Or, right. or oh, yeah. Um, Request for proposals. RFQs. RFQs, yeah. Though, yeah. These should be RFQs. Request for... There's public art lists, like mm. listing sites that you can find. What does the RFQ stand for? Request for qualifications. Request for qualifications. So now they want to see if you're qualified before you even make a proposal. Yeah, like the, you need a portfolio. Sometimes yeah. you need to be experienced already. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think what they do now is they do the RFQ. If you're qualified, then they ask you to submit a proposal, which they sometimes pay you for. They do pay you Just for, for doing the proposal. You are paid to do the proposal. You are paid to, to do, do the, the proposal, proposal yeah. Yes. And then once your proposal is in, they compare it to a ton of other people's proposals, and then there's a battle, and the victorious one <laughs> moves forward and gets the job. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these jobs, I mean, it's a long process to get there. You're, you're you know, it. It's a lot of your time, too, that's not paid for, like, just to submit all this, right? And then um, the job is, let's say, for example, the Belvedere pools that you worked on. Belvedere Park Swimming Pools Aquatic Center, if you've seen it, um, has uh, this tile work, tile work all the way around it, inside it and outside it, in the front and in the back. And that was, like, a, what, two-year project? <clears throat> so... Not only um, do you have to know your artwork, but you have to have project management skills. And um, tell us about that part of, you know, the long-term project from beginning to end, if you could. Um, yeah, the skills you need to be in public art um, are, man you know, oversight, management, um, being able to work with engineers and architects and um, your project manager, uh, this with the city or county, whoever you're working for. Um, you have to be aware that you're making art for a public space. Um, and so that involves um, community outreach, um, you know, research, learning about the history of a location, um, being sensitive to the historical and current residents, um, being sensitive to the architecture that's already there, um, and, uh, you know, you should already have some design skills, hopefully, yeah. and... Well, that's uh, how you got the job. Then you have to learn how to work with fabricators, because you might not yeah. be working with materials that you're familiar with. So you have to learn how the thing is manufactured, how then it's hung or put together into the building, and you have to work with engineers f to, like, calculate weight... And material. Yeah, I mean, depending on the project, but oh, yeah. I hire um, fabricators and installers. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's not as easy as saying I hire fabricators. You have to also research that and find I've, out. I find exactly. the fabricator that matches with my artistic vision. Yeah, yeah. I've worked with actually quite a, f quite a lot of different um, tile fabricators, um, steel fabricators. In different jobs, right? Yeah, for different jobs. And um, I mean that job alone, how many pieces of tile that you make yourself? For the job you're talking about, we made four, around 4,000. Um, we hand painted, hand silk screened the tiles. Wow. Um, individ I did, for that project, I decided to do it myself because I just yeah. wanted to because it was before I had children. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was so this project was really cool because it was for a aquatic center. Mm. And so my idea was to photograph people swimming underwater mm -hmm. from the neighborhood mm -hmm. um, and that those were going to be my references for my artwork so um, I texted this guy in you um, <laughs> named Rafa and I was like do you know anyone who can photograph underwater me <laughs> and he was you were like I just happened to have my scuba license. Yeah, I had my scuba um, <laughs> certification, yeah. Yeah, so I was like, what? Okay, so I was like, let's go to this pool. Ober we went to Obergon Pool, and you went underwater, and I, um, we just like got the kids that were there that day to like sign releases and they would dive under yeah we worked together with the park it wasn't we yeah. didn't just show up <laughs> no no we had permission of we course. had permission we everybody. had parents and we had yeah. people sign um releases and yeah all that stuff. yeah and so like you would 
I would sort of tell you what I wanted and like you would go down there and I would be like, I hope that's working out. That was crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a lot of fun too. It was really fun. Yeah, yeah. And those pictures came out cool. And then I used those pictures um, as references for paper cut drawings mm. that were then translated into laser cut steel. Yeah. And, and so you had your tiles laid on top of that, you had the laser cut steel silhouette of the pictures. It's really interesting. If you get a chance, go to Belvedere Park Aquatic Center and take a look. And if you go inside, some of my photos are in there. And yeah, and then the LA County Arts was like, let's get some of those original photos in frames. And they're in the lobby. They're inside the lobby, yeah. 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 No, that was a lot of fun and a really cool project. And I'm proud of it every time I pass by it. Um, but yeah, I mean, back to get getting back to um, like managing this whole thing. It's it's not as easy as just like I'm a good artist. Like hire me, you know. I mean, there's there's a lot of qualified artists. There's a, a ton of qualified artists. So once you uh, get the contract, you have to learn to follow through the contract and maintain a good reputation on that side of the business as well not just your art looking good but also that you can manage a job and be on time relatively speaking I mean there's a lot of flexibility with that of course so that you can then get another job or so that you know they could see your your trajectory and and your work that you've been doing and so yeah I mean those projects I mean to me they're plus you did the last part of the puzzle is you have to design something that you can say will last 20 to 30 years to more years. Mm. So and do you mean last uh, in outside, you know? Okay. So what lasts like through the, the elements. weather? Yeah. Elements, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah. And what, what, um, other projects have you been working on since I know you did something in El Sereno? Yeah. I just finished a big mural in El Sereno this year called El Sereno Serape. Um, and, but just since we're here uh, in Boyle Heights, I have a really big mural here yeah, it's in Mariachi Plaza, but it's underground in the yeah. metro station, and that's my second metro station I did. Yeah. And it's a hand-painted mural. If you're um, in Boyle Heights, you can walk down to the section where, yeah, the, come see it. where the mural is, and you don't have to have a tap card to look at it, you know? No, no, no. You can <coughs> just go down the escalator yeah, and see it. Yeah, before going into the paid part of it. But yeah, it's a, it's a big mural. Yeah. And that was also something that I got to have a little tiny hand in. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we photographed a lot of local people holding objects in their hands, and um, those were all part of the mural. Yeah, so the, the mural is um, Boyle Heights residents' hands only holding objects of significance um, that I asked them to bring like either to, so we set up a photo booth um, at the farmer's market, or um, we also set up another booth at Self Help Graphics, and I was able to capture like pe people's hand portraits and then use those as references. And, and yeah, and in their hand portraits, they brought something, or they held something that they did daily or worked on daily, or? The objects had to either represent to them Boyle Heights or themselves as mm -hmm. residents of Boyle Heights. Mm -hmm. And then I took, you know, I took, I had over 300 options by the end of my, my research, and I was then narrowing it down to create a narrative for, a narrative for the mural. Mm -hmm. And if you um, come see the mural, it's, it's not a, like a rectangle or a square, it's some shapes and it turns around corners and has a different shape <clears throat> but really cool stuff any anything new on the horizon as far as public art works um yeah i have a few things going um that you can talk about without <laughs> <laughs> um i'm trying to remember <laughs> What I have going right now? Um, oh yeah, I just finished a mural in Westminster in Orange County. Mm. Um, have something going like in like the Pomona area right now. Nothing too exciting to share though. Mm. Kind of trying to take a break right now. Like I said, I've been doing public art for 15 years straight, and um, I really want to spend some time on my studio work this year. That's what I was going to ask you yeah. next. Is um, I know that um, you. You've done paintings, and then also you're 
print work. Yeah. And um, and then you just got crazy busy with public art. Yeah. But I, I was wondering like took over everything. Yeah. yeah. So I was wondering if you were gonna get back to making just paint. Yeah, I've been start. Canvas. I've been starting small last year or so, like starting with small works on um, panels because I'm like warming up to getting into bigger paintings. Mm. But I always through all of this, I've been making print editions and selling print editions. I've always done that. Um, but yeah, um, have some cool ideas that I'm working on. Mm. Yeah. And now that you have your little studio, well, you've always yes. had a studio. <laughs> so um, you can make some bigger pieces. So yeah, that studio that I grew up you know, selling my work in as a kid is now my studio. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And so what, um, I don't know, like what is the process for you from like letting go of like public art and getting into painting and how do you prepare for that or is there a preparation for that or you just get into it and do it? Um... Or is it just till it burns inside you that you have to do it? <laughs> I'm just trying to take baby steps and not, like, overwhelm myself. Because, like, the thing with public art is it kind of, like, hugs you in that there's parameters. Like, you're, the parameters, you know what community you're working with and what space you're working in with. And you can kind of fill that in. Um, but, like, when you're making work for yourself, there's, there's the vastness mm. that, that can um, kind of intimidate me sometimes. Mm. So I'm trying to like just do baby steps right now and not like freak myself out too much. Mm. Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. That's why I wonder like maybe if it's not until like something is burning inside you that you're like, all right, that's it. I have to paint this. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I definitely pay, like, I'm sensitive to those signals. Like, sometimes I will, like, I have to paint this, and it's, like, a smaller project. Mm -hmm. And so I just say, yes, you are allowed to, like, paint this small, like, thing if you want to. And I'm mm -hmm. just trying to, like, give myself, like, permission to follow those um, impulses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you do um, for yourself? Like, I'm just wondering, if, is there any kind of, like, continuous learning that you do for yourself just to stay like sharp or to stay you know um wh wherever the game is if you want to call it the game you know is there anything like that that you do yeah can you tell <laughs> us about it <laughs> is this or is it like secret kung fu stuff i haven't really been going out and about anymore because you know i have two kids now and then there was like this whole thing with a pandemic mm. so uh a lot of exploration has been through reading or through the internet um, or like just watching TikTok mm. or, you know, um, anything, but. Um, Can you recommend to our listeners a book <laughs> or something? Um, I just say that I've, I've been learning a lot from my family the last couple of years. Okay. And just like that's like valid you know mm. just being like locked in the house with like ourselves and but i i was more aiming towards like artwork like how do you why is it not the same thing you know well, i don't know so then explain that to me then i just i mean i think like that like I don't know, maybe as a female artist, I'm just, like, more attuned to the fact that, like, family life is artwork mm. and is work, and it's, like, all meshed together. Mm -hmm. And I don't really consider it to be, like, separate, you know? Yeah. I mean, that, that makes a ton of sense. I hadn't thought of it because I'm a, a dude. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. But also... Um, I just I noticed, mean, like, a lot of the, like, the male artists that come on here, like, they don't even talk about their family. Not necessarily yeah. all of them. Yeah. But, like... Why, is that, why isn't that, like, integrated into your art? Like, that's your mm. life. That's what you spend all your hours doing, you know what I mean? That's interesting, yeah. So then, uh, are, you, are you saying that, like, through life, through family, and through learning, you've moved forward with your art? Yeah. I don't know how it's going to look, but I think it's moved forward by, you know, just yeah. from me moving forward. yeah. Huh. Okay. I love that. I'm the art moves forward regardless if I'm making it or not. That's what I'm. I guess we're saying. Hmm. So um. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't want to ask, like, what can we expect from you because you're not even there yet, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I dig the process, and I can't wait to see whatever comes up. Yeah, just watch, you know, I'll share. <laughs> I should post everything, you know, post, like everyone. I got an Instagram. <laughs> wow. Um, what do you do, um, like, on a weekly if you're not working on, all oh, right, I mean, you just, you've had so much work that you don't <laughs> I don't know. I'm just wondering if there's, like, little exercises you do for yourself. Yeah. I mean, like, I used to write artist pages, but I don't do that anymore. That's, like, when you write three pages in the morning. Mm -hmm. Or, like, I used to meditate, but I don't really do that anymore. Or wa I walk every, pretty much every day. I used um, to meditate every day, and I haven't been able to lately. I, yeah. I completely forget. Completely. But I have a practice, like I have a spiritual practice where like if I need to, like I can center my brain and like go into myself and like find my creativity and like calm my yeah. thoughts. Like I have that mm. that I reach for occasionally. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah. Do you want to share that? Um, well, center yourself, go into your brain, like find your artistic impulse, like honor it, shut, up, shut down all the noise, you know. Do you do it, do you do it through meditation then or do you have like? Is it or is it just? Yeah, like meditation, writing. Um, you just find it. You just find it. yeah. It's just part of. My, I had to develop that part of my practice over mm. the years. Is that something you do like before you're gonna work every time or? Sometimes. Mm. If I have time. If you have time, yeah. Or if I'm centered or. And how has it been um, with the kids around now that you're painting with them around? I notice that sometimes um your baby girls makes her own paintings while you're making paintings, right? Well, they're not really allowed in my studio, to tell you the truth. But <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Speaking of family. <laughs> <laughs> so, Walt, is there anything are that, no, so they're not allowed in your studio while you're working. All right. No, it's too hard. <laughs> I, I thought I had the fantasy of them, like, being there, like, observing my artist. It's artisticness, you know, but no, they're ridiculously distracting. <laughs> and babies. Uh, my daughter yesterday, she was like, Mom, did I inherit my love of making things from your sister? <laughs> like, what about <laughs> and I was me? like, What? And then I was like, Oh, yeah, I never like let you watch me anymore. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's interesting. And um, your son, is he painting yet or drawing yet? How little is he? He's only four. Yeah. He's still little, yeah. Yeah, my, my, my daughter's more inclined so far. Yeah. Yeah, I I've remember seeing some posts of her work or little drawings that she's made. Yeah. Wow. So what's next for you, lady? Um, just drawing, painting, printmaking. This got start going out more. Yeah. Going to exhibits. Yeah. Is it hard for you to go to exhibits? Is it harder? Yeah. Yes. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> uh, like well, why? It, well, you know, kids go to sleep at. Yeah. Fi I finally just, um, you know, got my youngest to go to sleep without me. So mm. I can do that now. Is there any art shows that you're looking forward to this year that you will be a part of? No. Nada. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see. What would you like to talk about? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I could pause that right there. So I remember um, when we first met, I came over to, to your Avenue 50 studios. Oh, yeah. So in 2000s, I used to go to Avenue 50 Studio in Highland Park all the time to do figure drawing yeah. on Tuesday nights. And I would do that forever. And it was sort of my way of staying connected. And it turned out that Kathy had this, like, big vacant space in the back. Um, it used to be John Valadez's studio, but he was gone. Oh, really? And um, I thought to myself, like, here's my studio. And I wasn't paying rent at home at the time because I was living with my mom, so I could afford it. So I rented out this really quite large nice. space, like a thousand square foot space behind Avenue 50 Studio, which is a gallery that serves the Latinx community of Highland Park. 
It must and, have been a steal back then. Yeah, like comparatively, it was Jesus. less. Jesus. Um, but um, it had already jumped in price since John had it. Mm. But, um, yeah, so I had my studio there from 2007 till 2004, till I got pregnant in 2014. Yeah. And you also did the holiday sale there, right? But yeah. Not, like not we, the we same. Start, we, we brought the ho- holiday sale energy there yeah, those during those years. And we also had monthly art walks. So I opened up my studio to the public every second Saturday for all of those years, which was definitely like an experience. I definitely like got to know the community there in that area, like the local neighbors, um, the art walk people, like just, you know. Did that um, make you, like, constantly uh, produce work? Produce um, new work? or? Yeah. I mean, like, I always had to always like, showing it. stuff, you know, letting other people show in my space as well, you know, being part of the community. Um, Paula Lopez and, and Heriberto Luna were next door. Yeah. Tina Rodas was another neighbor. Like, we had a little community going for a long yeah. time. Yeah. And, and you had exhibits also, right? I mean, And, yeah, like, the gallery with, in front the had gallery. a show. Ha- yeah, I showed in the ga- – actually, I had my f- first solo show ever at Avenue 50 Studio mm. in 2006 before I moved in there. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. That's some history. Yeah. I, I haven't been to Avenue 50 in a minute. I got to pay them a Me visit. Too. What was the name of your studio? I remember it had – She Rides the Lion. She Rides the Lion. Yeah, if you guys ever, like, drove by on the, the metro – yeah, you can it went see right out. It's still there, actually. The sign is still there. You can see my lion. It's a blue building on yeah. Avenue 50 it's, as the train crosses um, yeah. over. Yeah, Avenue yeah. 50 and Fig. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, dude. Well, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you would like to cover? Um, no, just like... Happy family <laughs> stuff. <and> that's it. <laughs> just keep going. <laughs> just keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there a, a place where people can find you on the internet? Yeah, my website's my name, soniaromero.net. And uh, I'm on Instagram most often mm-hmm. at Sonia Amalia Romero. Sonia Amalia Romero. And um, there's a question that we ask everybody at the end of this podcast. And um, if you could answer in one, quest- in one sentence, if you were asked, Sonia Romero, how do you do it? Um, I say just keep going, you know, like no matter like how your mind tries to get you to stop, you know, you just keep going. Yeah. There is a lot of um, barriers we put on ourselves or barriers that people try to place around us. And yeah, you just Just keep keep going. You got to keep. Just like, all right, thanks. And then just keep going. (laughs) (laughs) All right, thanks. I got to go and keep working. Well, Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming down here to this little spot and um, talking with us. And um, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>